I'd often heard some of Dad's wartime stories, but it was the promptings of a friend of his that eventually led to the memoirs getting written down. This friend was very interested in military history, and he used to tell Dad that all the things they talked about over a glass of beer would die with him if there was no record. So one Easter, when I went home, I discovered some handwritten sheets of lined paper next to his favourite armchair, and I asked my mother about them. She told me he'd started writing, but that she wasn't allowed to read anything. I didn't say anything to him, but on my next visit, I found the pile had grown. This time, curiosity got the better of me, and so without asking permission, I started reading. And once I'd started, I couldn't stop, and my eyes filled with tears a couple of times. Then I talked to Dad about it and suggested I write them up on the computer. At first he seemed surprised that I would want to take the trouble, but actually I found it fascinating. Over the following weeks and months, memories started falling into chronological order. Dad had kept his flying logbook and that also helped to pinpoint when certain events had taken place. So since his old friend had emphasised that such memories are valuable, we've placed a short extract with the My Story Project. I hope you enjoy listening. This is an extract of um, Jim Fowler's wartime memoirs, this man who from Sheffield fought in the Second World War. I myself and those of my age group had seen many pictures of the 1914-1918 war depicting the horror of the zigzag trenches, the infantry, the cold, slimy mud and the carnage on, on the battlefields of France. This was our image of war. But what looked more respectable were the pictures of biplanes in dogfights with the Germans. A pilot in front and a bloke in the cockpit behind swivelling and firing a machine gun. These visions must have been running through my mind when, on September the 4th, I announced to my parents that I was joining the Air Force. Right, you want to join the RAF. What do you want to be, he asked. Pilot, Sergeant, I limited my limited knowledge of the RAF in those days being of pilots and aeroplanes. Had a university education, no Sergeant, grammar school. We're only taking university students as pilots, he said. What a far cry from much later on in the war when the MO, that's the medical officer, simply felt air crew applicants as, and if they were warm, they were in. The sergeant picked up a sheet of paper and began to read out the various members of aircrew, wireless, operator, navigator, etc. I dived in, wireless operator being mentioned immediately after pilot. Can I be a wireless operator then, sergeant? If you pass the test, yes. Arriving at Le Havre late, late evening, we were marched to the railway station, where we were issued with one blanket each and slept the night on the floor. The next morning, after being provided with coffee and French bread, we boarded a train bound for no one knew where. Arriving eventually at Chateaubriand, approximately 60 kilometres north of Nantes, we were marched a lengthy distance to the camp. It was a mixed army and air force unit. But why we were there and whatever our function was was never explained. The four WOPs, Mel and I, a Brummie and a Liverpoolian were simply told to listen out for any messages on a receiver in a wooden hut. Where from, from whom, we never knew, and in any case never received any. In the short time we were in the camp, Mel and I paid a visit to Nantes. We saw personnel with flimsy dressed French tops flitting from table to table touting for custom. My dad's short note given to me on leaving home immediately flashed across my mind. Be careful of French women. He must have had a premonition. Dawn was breaking when we arrived at Saint-Nazaire. Three Spitfires were patrolling the area, giving a comfortable sense of safety and security. Fifteen minutes after the Spits flew off, four Stukas arrived and began strafing the docks. We could hear the bullets clattering on the protective roof of our shelter, but surprisingly no bombs were dropped. The Stukas left and twenty minutes later the Spitfire patrol reappeared. The performance was repeated two or three times. It became increasingly apparent that there must have been German fifth columnists in the area communicating with the Stuker airfield, which couldn't have been very far away, giving them the all clear to return.
We were finally marched 50 at a time onto a waiting French tug, the Georgic, a peacetime luxury liner converted to a troop ship. I'd arrived I was crouched under a small suspended boat on the tug's deck. Mel, without his helmet, was leaning on the tug's rail, peering down at the sea. He turned to me and said, look there, Jim, I can see bullets splashing in the water. The Stukas had returned. Get your helmet on and come under here, you silly bugger. I remonstrated. Mel couldn't care less and continued gazing down at the sea. The tug drew alongside the Georgic and was about to raise the gangway when I veered off. it veered off some 50 yards away. We could hear the screech of the falling bomb. It crashed into the water between the tug and the Georgic. The liner captain had obviously given orders to the tug pilot to move away, thereby reducing the target area. Good job he did. Pulling alongside again, we clambered up the gangway onto the lower deck of the ship and in the process I lost my kit bag, which rolled off my shoulder into the sea due to the side-to-side -side swaying of the gangway.